All right, welcome to the final hour. You made it. You can stay awake for 50 more minutes. I would love it. <laughs> I hope I can stay awake for 50 more minutes. It's been a long, fast-paced day. Hopefully you've learned a lot and uh, we'll go back to your regular jobs and put some of this stuff to work. So our topic for the final hour-ish is uh, true availability with synthetics. What is synthetics and how can you use it? Uh, we added browser instrumentation in our very first session. We had our FoodMe app, we added the JavaScript agent. That agent, that JavaScript goes down to the end user's browser and it measures how long the page takes to load in their browser with their internet connection. And it also measures the individual resources on the page and how long, like you can figure out which images or which JavaScript or uh, CSS files are taking the most time, et cetera. Um, so if we've already got browser monitoring, a, a browser product, why do we need synthetics? Well, if you think about it, measuring performance in the end user's browser has a couple of limitations. First of all, you're only going to get data from pages that your users actually visit, right? In order for the browser to gather that performance data, the user has to visit the page in their browser. So if you have a feature of your site or a seldom used uh, function, it could have some bug or performance problem lurking in there and you wouldn't know about it until an actual user visited that page and encountered that problem. Um, what else? Oh, a lot of the data or the performance issues that your users may experience are beyond your control. If I visit your site and I have maybe a, like my mother-in-law used to pay for a $20 a month internet connection that was like 256 meg, right? It was like the cheapest, slowest internet, which was fine for what she did. She did email and Facebook and whatever. But uh, if she visits your e-commerce site with her slow internet connection, the, your page might take 30 seconds to load in her browser. That's what New Relic Browser is gonna tell you. That page load time was 30 seconds. And there's nothing you can do about that. It's not a problem with your site. It's the user just has a slow connection, right? Or maybe they're tethered to their 4G cellular connection. So browser is gonna measure what the end user actually experienced, but it may not really, what's the word? There may be nothing you can do about it to improve that performance. So synthetics on the other hand is a controlled environment. It's always a fast internet connection, a dedicated virtual machine. Uh, you can control exactly which pages or which features of your application get monitored. So synthetics is essentially a robot browser. It's a browser that you can automate to say, you could do just simple URLs, visit this URL on a schedule to make sure that my site is online, tell me how well it's performing. And then you could set up an alert to say, notify me if it's down or if it's slow. But you can also automate the browser to simulate user behavior. So we'll go back to our e-commerce example. If you wanna make sure that people can hit the homepage, search for a product, add it to their cart, go through the checkout flow, uh, you can write a script to do that and then measure the performance and also set up alert notifications if that process is failing. Uh, so that's where synthetics comes in. And so you can see there are pros and cons of both. Synthetics is great at being proactive finding problems before users see them because your robot browser is gonna hit that problem, hopefully, uh, before an actual user does. And it's a good baseline because it's a controlled environment. So uh, if synthetics tells you that your site is slow, it probably really is slow. Whereas if browser tells you it's slow, it might be the user, they might have a slow connection or whatever. On the other hand, browser data is valuable because it's going to give you information about the actual browsers, device types, and locations around the world that your users are coming from. Synthetics is limited to one type of browser, Linux, Chrome on Linux on the desktop. That's the only browser that Synthetics has available. Uh, and we've got like 20 cities to choose from. So 
The number of browsers, device types, and locations is much more limited in synthetics. New Relic Browser will tell you where your users are actually coming from and what they're using. And uh, it's gonna capture things like JavaScript errors that your actual users experience. So it's good debugging info uh, coming from the real world. So we used to sell these products separately uh, and we would say, you know, it's great if you use both of them, but you would have to decide to pay for both of them. But now that we have full stack observability at one price, you get the full meal deal. You have both of them if, you've, if you're a full stack observability customer. So use both of them, you know, get your real user data in browser, but also set up some synthetic monitors uh, to take advantage of all of the, the benefits that it provides. So that's what we're gonna do today. The bulk of our time is labs. So I hope that you either have an account or would like to use our training account to actually create some synthetics monitors. <clears throat> that's, that's what this is about. There are seven types of synthetic monitors now. Uh, the simplest is called a ping monitor. It's not a network like an ICMP where you ping a server. Uh, we just call it a ping. It's a simple HTTP GET request of a URL, and it's essentially a smoke test. If I send a GET request to this URL, am I going to get a 200 response back? Is, is the server answering? Uh, so you can do ping monitors, <clears throat> which don't even load a page in a real browser. It's just an HTTP object that sends a GET and checks the response code. And you can optionally look for a string of text in the response. So if I visit newrelic.com, I can check and make sure that response has the string new relic in it and not like error, <laughs> some horrible thing. Okay, so ping is the simplest. The next level up from that is the simple browser monitor, which is very similar to a ping. You give it a single URL, but in this case, it loads the full page in a real browser with all of the resources on the page, all of the CSS, JavaScript file, images, et cetera. So that's gonna tell you how long did the full page take to load? And then you can go in and look at the results of that page load to see which resources were the most time consuming. A uh, couple of other ones above ping here. Uh, there's a broken links monitor where you give it a URL and we will scan all of the links on that URL and make sure that they point to somewhere valid. Uh, so it's a good way to check pages for broken links. If you have a secure site, an SSL uh, certificate on your site, um, you can give us the URL or actually give us the domain name and the number of days prior to expiration that you wanna check for. So tell me if the certificate on this site will expire within the next 30 days, for example. And then that check returns true or false. If it's gonna expire within 30 days, you'll get a, a failure, I guess. And if it's got more than 30 days, then that monitor will succeed. Uh, okay, so those are fairly simple. We, you give us a domain or a single URL and our robot browser will check those. The other three are more complex. Uh, if you want to automate the browser to perform a series of actions, the scripted browser will allow you to write that code. We use Selenium WebDriver with the JavaScript bindings. So you can write Node.js code to perform a series of actions. Uh, as a developer, I don't find that very difficult to do, but a lot of our customers, particularly like ops people, uh, are not coders, so that's pretty daunting. So if you don't wanna have to write that script from scratch, uh, we have recently added this step monitor. I'll show you what that looks like a little bit later, where you can, in the UI, you can specify a series of steps. Okay, first I want you to visit this URL, then, I want you to find a field on the page and enter some text into it. Then I want you to find a button and I want you to click it. Then I want you to wait until a particular element becomes visible. So you can do all of those as a series of steps just by filling in fields uh, on the page and we will generate the script for you. We actually show you the code that gets generated if you wanna look at it or modify it. Okay, so step monitor is just a, an interactive way to generate a script without having to write all that code by hand. Another option, which is not really supported by New Relic, but it is available to you. There are a couple of script recorders, third-party script recorders that know how to 
export in New Relic Synthetics format. So you can use the SE Builder from the Selenium project. Uh, it's a plugin for Firefox, and you add that plugin, go to the web page that you want to generate a script for, say hit record, and then perform your actions. And then when you stop recording, it will have generated a script to replay those actions. And you can say export this script as um, in, in synthetics format as a script. So there's SE Builder. The other one is a, a third party product called Catalon with a K, K A T A L O N. Catalon has a script recorder that's available for both Firefox and uh, Chrome. And then the last monitor type is like a scripted browser, but it's a, an HTTP object that you can use for hitting API endpoints. So if there's an API that's especially important to you, uh, could be one that you own. We have our own login endpoint and we wanna make sure it works. So we're gonna write a test to send requests to that endpoint and validate that the responses are what we expect. Or it could be a third party API. If your applications rely on the Salesforce API or the Facebook API or whatever, you can hit those endpoints. So again, it's just a way to write JavaScript code that hits an endpoint and then validates that the responses are what you expect. So those are the seven monitor types. Uh, Rick wants to know, how do you bulk add 40 endpoints to a ping monitor group? Well, you can't with a ping. Ping just takes one URL, but you could with a scripted browser or an API test, uh, you could put an array of URLs and then do a for each on the array. So that'd be a way to uh, loop through a series of endpoints in a single test if that's what you want. Or if you want to add 40 separate uh, synthetic checks, we have an API. You can create synthetic checks using an API. So you could write a script to do that. Is that what you're asking, Rick? Yeah, it's a for each loop. So loops through each item in an array and does a check on it. I'm, I'm gonna do a shameless plug, by the way. If you have questions that we're not able to answer or you wanna go deeper in the answer, let me open another browser here. We have a, an online technical community at discuss.newrelic.com. I'll put this link in the chat. Here we go. It's free. Okay. New Relic login. You've already you already can log into this account into this uh, website. So you're welcome to come here and search to see if we've already answered the question. I have answered Rick's question in the forum. How do I test multiple URLs in a single monitor using a loop? That answer is here with sample code. Uh, and if, if your question has not already been answered, then you're welcome to post it here. Uh, I'm active there. Our tech support staff are uh, are active so that's a good place to to post questions after today's session uh okay so we're going to do two labs first i have you create a couple of synthetics monitors and then the second lab is uh using the data that comes into our new relic database nrdb to create dashboards or alert conditions uh, based on that data Okay, so first of all, I'd like you to create a ping or a simple browser, do either or both, for the site of your choice. Could be your company's website, could be your personal website, could be Google, could be New Relic, pick a URL, um, but create a ping monitor, and I'll show you how to do that. Hopefully in your account, if you've got a New Relic account, you can do it there, but if you need to use our training account, uh, you can do that. Rachel just posted the credentials in the chat. Thank you. So we're going to go up to synthetics. And then I'm going to click down here, view all synthetic monitors. If you have access to multiple accounts, there's a drop down up here. And I'm going to filter this to just NRU training. Okay. And as Rachel mentioned earlier, there was another training today. So there's going to be some junk in here from that other session. Just ignore the ones that are already here. OK, so you're in synthetics in the NRU training or in your own account. And there is a button in the upper right that says create monitor. So you're going to click that. 
And then here are the seven types of monitors. So if you want to do a ping monitor, it's this one, the availability monitor. Or if you want to do a simple browser, it's this one over here that says page load performance. And the options for both of those look very similar. You're going to put a URL in there, give your monitor a name, the URL that you want to check. How frequently do you want that monitor to run? You can set a frequency. Uh, some advanced options like check for some string, uh, a substring in the response to make sure that it's valid. Uh, and then after you've filled in this page, the next screen when you do select locations will show you a list of the 20 public locations that we provide. Uh, there is a feature called private locations. Can I see that somewhere? Here it is, private locations. So you do have the option of uh, we will give you the Docker container. We call them minions, the little robot. Uh, we'll give you that Docker container that we use to visit your website. And you can host that wherever you like. So if you want a different city other than the 20 that we provide, or if you want to deploy it behind your firewall so that you can monitor intranet applications instead of those that are accessible from the public internet, uh, you can use a private location. OK, so that's uh, step one or part one of the lab is create uh, a ping monitor or a simple browser or both, if you like, uh, for the URL of your choice. Part two of this lab is to create a step or scripted browser monitor to log into your New Relic account. So you want to visit one.newrelic.com, go to the login page, fill in the email and the password. You can use the ones that Rachel provided uh, in the chat or your own if you like, to, if you want to log into your own account. OK, and so again, those are going to be two of the other monitor types. Here is the step monitor. If you want to provide the steps necessary to log in. And here is the scripted browser if you want to try to write it from scratch. I'm going to let you attempt that yourself. There is documentation. You can always go to the docs.newrelic.com site to learn how to do this stuff. And then uh, in about, I'll give you till the bottom of the hour, 13 minutes. At the bottom of the hour, I'm going to do the step monitor. I'll show you how to, how to do that. OK, any questions about the lab? If not, go for it. You have 13 minutes.
Okay, no rush. If you're actually doing the labs, you have five more minutes. But if you're not, then I don't want you to just sit here <laughs> reading uh, BuzzFeed. Uh, is anybody actually trying to do these and needs a few more minutes? Let me know if you need five minutes. Yes. Okay, no problem. I'll give you four more now, four more minutes. Yeah, Kirk points out that if you're already logged in, you can't see the login page. You would need to either use uh, an incognito browser or a different browser and go to go to the New Relic page. Uh, the actual URL, I believe, is login.newrelic.com slash login. That's the URL of the actual login page. But again, you'll need to do it in a browser that's not already logged in.
Okay, that's the bottom of the hour. I can give you a couple more minutes if you need them. And then I'm going to show you, how I'll do a step uh, monitor and show you how to make that work. <laughs> okay. Uh, you saved your code without testing. How do you get back in? You should be able to go to the list of synthetics and see the one you just created there. Which one is it, Andre? What's it called? Is it in the training account or is it in your own account? Oh, it's your own. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just pick one here. This one is a script. So if you click the monitor name, then on the left-hand side, there should be a script option. View script or something. Let's see. script here it is on the lower left and that'll take you back into the script you see that got it okay cool uh okay so let me open a by the way, speaking of incognito, in Firefox, there's an extension called multi-account containers. So I currently have a tab open in my orange or yellow account, and I'm going to open another tab in my blue account. So yellow is work, blue is personal, but they don't share cookies, right? So by opening this tab, I should not be logged in. Or if I am, I can log out. Here we go. Okay, so even though I'm logged in over here, this tab, which is a different color, uh, is not logged in. Okay, so the hard part of doing, to me anyway, uh, the challenge of doing a scripted browser or a step monitor is finding the elements on the page that you want to interact with. So we want to create a monitor that's going to navigate to this page, find this email field, and type our login email in here, then find the next button and click it. And then on the following page, there will be a password field. So we'll have to find that one, put our password in there, and then click the whatever it says, login, uh, to complete the login. OK. So I'm going to come over here and create a step monitor. I'll call it Phil's Step Monitor. Step Monitor is when uh, it marries your dad, but it's not really your, your mom. Sorry. Bad jokes at the end of the day. Uh, OK, give it a name. How frequently do I want it to run? I'll just say once an hour. And then locations. So here's our 20 public locations. And then our other trainers have deployed some private ones. So they would show up under here under private. Uh, I'll pick a few. I don't care. I'm only going to run this interactively. I'm not going to have it scheduled. So I'm in Portland. I'll always tick that one. Places I want to visit. Milan. Never been to Italy. Paris. Never been to Germany. Uh, where else have I never been? Never been to Brazil. And I've never been to Korea. Okay, so I'll pick up six locations. Then finally, the next button here is define my steps. So the first step always is navigate to a URL. And I'm just going to copy that one so I don't have to type it. Ooh, you can put GIFs in the chat. Cordially invited. There you go. Uh, OK, so here's the URL of our login page. That's the first step. Then the next step is to type some text, type text. 
So we need to be able to find the email field and then enter the text. So uh, in most browsers, you can right click in the field and select something like inspect. That's what Firefox has. That's gonna open the dev tools down here. It will find that field in the HTML. So there it is. And the simplest and most efficient way to select a field is if it's got a unique ID, which this one does, thankfully, login underscore email. If it didn't have a unique ID, I could use the name of the field, login square bracket email. I could use um, a class name, maybe can use XPath if I get really desperate, but ID is the most efficient. So login underscore email. So I'm gonna go over here and say type text. I want to find login underscore email and I want to enter the text learn at new relic, all right, relicuniversity.com, okay? So my script is gonna locate that field and enter that text. Then I need to click an element. The element is this button. That has an ID of login underscore submit. So I'm gonna put the ID in here, login underscore submit. And when it finds that, it'll click it. That'll take me to the next screen. So let's see what that looks like. If I put learn at New Relic Unit. I'm just doing this interactively so I can see what the next page is gonna look like. Okay, so that now makes my password field appear. And if I inspect that one, it's called login underscore password. And oh, I've got a CAPTCHA here. Hope that doesn't happen to my synthetic. That's, it is a robot. <laughs> so that would be a challenge. Uh, hopefully that won't pop up when our monitor runs against the page. Login underscore password. So I'm gonna type again. And what's our password? Citrus. Dash genealogist. Now you may be thinking, wait, I don't want to put my credentials in plain text in here because this is going to generate a script and it wouldn't be good to have, you know, real passwords in there. So there is a feature. Let's see. Can I show it to you without losing my place? There is a feature in synthet synthetics called secure credentials. So I think I'm logged in with a user who has enough permissions to do this. If you have sufficient permissions, then you can create these. So you give it a key like username or I thought I had a training username. Anyway, uh, give it a key and then you provide a value. Uh, and unless you put the value in the description, which I would not recommend for a password, um, it's invisible, you can't see it. And then in your script, you would say dollar sign secure dot key name, and it'll go to this AWS secure store and get the actual value. So it's a key value store that is secure in the cloud encrypted. And then in your script, you only see the key name, you never see the value. So that's a way to create these without hard coding the sensitive data, but I'm just putting it here to save time. Uh, okay, and then I wanna click login submit again, click. Login submit, and then really to make sure that it worked, I should Let me log in and see the next page. I should wait until an element appears that's on the, the next screen, right? To make sure that I logged in successfully. So what was this citrus dash geologist and I am not a robot. 
Okay, cool. So after I log in, I get to this New Relic One landing page. And I want to wait until like this menu bar becomes visible. Can I get that? I'm getting drop down menus. I want the menu bar inspect. There we go. App header. That's pretty good. Yeah, so we'll wait until this thing becomes available. So it's a div with a class of AAGVAC wind app header. Can I copy that? And here's the full tag. Oh, it's a bunch of nested divs, but I, I just want this one. Okay. So if I go back here and say, after I click the login button the second time, then I want to assert that an element, the element is that class name is present or visible. I'll just say present. Okay. So I want to wait until that app header is there. Okay. So there's my step monitor. Uh, there is a script, right? If I click over here, I could see the generated code, but I'm going to make sure it works first before I, I don't want to lose my work. Okay. Here we go. Validate. So I can run it and see if it works. Now, unfortunately, this can take Several minutes, as it says. It's running from Frankfurt. Uh, Rick wonders, how do you get past the CAPTCHA? Um, obviously, the whole point of a CAPTCHA is to make sure that it's a person and not a robot. So if your site always shows a CAPTCHA, um, the workaround would be to do like a, an allow list. We used to call it a white list before that term was fraught. Um, and we give you the... IP addresses of the synthetics monitor. So on your site, you would have to say, this IP address is allowed in without having to pass the CAPTCHA. That's the only workaround that I know of, is to basically tell your site, do not show the CAPTCHA if the traffic is coming from synthetics. in full browser with Selenium. This is full browser. The only Selenium check that's not a full browser is ping or API test. All the rest of them are actually spinning up uh, a Docker container with a real, real browser. Yeah, Tony says you could try to find the element and click it. But I think the, the whole point of that is that the way a human clicks it is going to be different from the way a robot or a script clicks it. That's why it's there. You could try it. I think the more reliable way is to just tell your site not to show a CAPTCHA if it knows that the traffic is coming from synthetics. Okay, I hope this completes soon because I'd like to give you some time to do uh, some queries and dashboards. Actually, I'm, while this thinks, let's start on uh, some of those queries. So when a synthetic check runs, it generates a synthetic check event. Uh, and that synthetic check has, of course, the name of the monitor, the result, did it succeed or fail, a duration that tells you how long it took to complete, et cetera. So what query would I write to figure out the percentage of successful checks for a ping monitor? Let's 
see if I can find a ping monitor here. There is a, this one, Pet Clinic AWS ping. That's a ping monitor. So if I go to query my data, and say from synthetic check, where monitor name is at clinic AWS ping. And I want to know the percentage of checks where the result is success. Anybody have an idea what I would do here? Let's see if there's something about percentages. Oh, look at that. There is a percentage function. Okay, the first parameter is like the denominator, the bottom of that fraction. So that's going to be count the number of x. And then after the comma is the numerator. What do we want on the top of this fraction? We want the number of checks where result is success. Okay, so that's going to give me number of successful results divided by total number of results. That's my percentage, okay? And by default, if I don't put a since on here, it'll do the last hour. Let's see. Oh, zero <laughs> percent, really? What do we have for? Yeah, I think I saw five fail when you were looking at the list. I think I saw five failures okay. out of five. So well, I think it's accurate. That monitor is not healthy. But okay, so there's my uptime. That's zero. Let's see if there's one that actually has some successes. Yeah, that's six out of six failures. I don't know why. Why is that failing? This one is 83%. You can see it right here. So let's do that one. Pet Clinic AWS. Same query. I'm just going to change the name of the monitor. Come on, I clicked. Is it going to open? Okay, so instead of Pet Clinic AWS ping, we'll just do Pet Clinic AWS. There we go. So this one has a 91.53% success rate in the last hour. What if I do since... Uh, a month. I don't know if I have enough data. I'll try it. 30 days ago. Okay. 80.33% over the last 30 days. And if I make it a time series, see how it fluctuates over time. Okay. So that's uptime percentage of success. I'll have to figure out what, what's wrong with that ping monitor, why it's not working. Okay, how's our monitor doing? Oh, it failed. It worked because you can see the screenshot is my homepage. Okay, so it did log me in, but the assertion that that menu bar is there returned false. So I'd have to go into my step monitor and figure out why does it not think that menu bar is present. But anyway, it did log us in and got us to that homepage. So that's, that's a step monitor. And then if I go to the script tab, if I wanted to modify this for some reason, I could actually copy this script into a scripted browser monitor and, and tweak it if I wanted to. You know what I think is that this six character prefix is random. It's not always the same. I think that's why I didn't find it. Why the comma in the NRQL query? Which comma?
This comma? That's the only one. Uh, because percentage takes two parameters. It takes the bottom of the fraction and the top of the fraction. So the bottom is number of synthetic checks and the top half, the top of the fraction is the ones that had a successful result. And then it divides the top by the bottom to get a percentage. Uh, yeah, so I think that six character prefix is different. I like our riffs has guac in it. I want guac. <laughs> um, so that I think that's what happened is I can't use that uh, element class name or whatever, because it's different every time. Uh, okay. What was our other query? We are almost out of time. Uh, an alert, I'm just gonna do this, the last one and then wrap up. An alert condition to notify me if the synthetic success rate falls below 95%. So, uh, I have this query, this is the percentage. I'm gonna copy this. And then if I go to Alerts. I don't have a policy in here. Can I steal somebody's? I'll steal Eric's. I don't know if he's on our group or an earlier one. Or you could steal the one that I did earlier. That's right. It doesn't matter. Uh, add a condition of type NRQL. Uh, name, synthetics, time. And then my query was this one. Percentage where result equals success, where monitor name is Pet Clinic AWS. Here's my data. And I would want to say open a violation when the query returns a value below 0 0.95. Is that what it was? 95%. Is the value a fraction or an, yeah, because it said one at least once. Yeah, okay, so if I say at least once in five minutes, then anytime it drops below 100, you can see that. But I might want to say, ah, don't wake me up if it fails once and then comes back up. So I want to say, if it goes below 0.95 for five, is five the minimum? No, I can do two minutes. So you can see a few times where it failed or was below 95% for two consecutive minutes. Okay, so you can do an NRQL condition based on synthetic data and then say, notify me if the success rate is less than some threshold. Okay, uh, Rachel posted a link to the docs, the NRQL reference documentation. So if you wanna learn all about how to write NRQL queries in detail. Uh, it's all there. And I am four minutes over. Any last questions about synthetics? Before we wrap up. Okay, well, thanks so much for your time and attention today. We hope you learned useful stuff and that you'll go out into your own New Relic accounts and start setting up synthetics monitors and alert conditions and create dashboards and all that cool stuff. We hope to see you at a future training. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening.